Item number, SCP-395, Object Class, Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. SCP-395 is to be kept in the center of a locked room at least 10 meters wide. No female personnel are to be allowed into SCP-395's room under any circumstances. The room is to be guarded by two male personnel at all times. Any unusual behavior should be reported immediately. Any independent movement on the part of SCP-395 should likewise be reported. SCP-395 is to be fed one liter of a half-and-half -half mixture of blood and milk, both taken from the same individual, once a week. Failing to follow a regular feeding schedule will cause SCP-395 to increase its range, at a rate of 10 meters per day without food. If it has not been fed for more than one week past its expected time, it will begin to… Description SCP-395 is a human fetus, approximately seven months into its development, contained in a specimen jar. The jar is filled with a standard formaldehyde solution, with traces of blood. When a female human comes within five meters of the jar, SCP-395 is able to telepathically influence her. At that point, the subject will feel a need to remove SCP-395 from its jar and allow it to feed in the normal manner. All women, regardless of age or medical status, will lactate under this telepathic inducement. Once the milk has been exhausted, SCP-395 will continue to feed, drawing blood and gnawing flesh from the subject. The subject apparently feels satisfaction throughout this process only understanding what has actually happened when SCP-395 is sated and releases its control. SCP-395 was taken from a traveling freak show, whose owner had been using it to control women for his own personal use. It was discovered when police tracked the bodies of his victims back to him. One of the arresting officers fell under SCP-395's control and killed her partner when he attempted to stop her from removing it from its jar. Foundation agents caught the report from the follow-up investigation and acquired SCP-395. Interrogation of SCP-395's owner revealed little. He had acquired it along with the rest of the show from the previous owner's estate. Documentation included with the estate indicated that SCP-395 had been purchased from a teaching hospital in the early 1900s. No information regarding the parents was included. Testing by male personnel shows no detectable life signs while SCP-395 is inside the formaldehyde solution in its jar. Only when a female human subject comes within its range does it become active, exhibiting a faint heartbeat and high levels of brain activity. Item Number SCP-400 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures the single colony of SCP-400 in Foundation custody, designation SCP-400-B, is currently housed in a juvenile humanoid containment cell at Site-77's Euclid Objects Wing. Any cell containing an active SCP-400 colony must be secured with an airlock door under Biosafety Level 4 precautions. Any openings for ventilation must be covered by a metal screen with gaps no greater than 0.2 centimeters in diameter followed by aerosol filter 400 AF to be changed monthly and remanded to on-site chemical research personnel with level 3 slash 400 clearance. Access for experimentation purposes requires approval from both the Ethics Committee and the Items Acting HMCL Supervisor, currently Dr. Marshall Grant. SCP-400 handlers are required to wear level 4 positive pressure biohazard suits and must be decontaminated prior to egress. In emergency situations, prevention of olfactory contact with SCP-400 is sufficient to prevent accidental exposure in most cases. For caregiving instructions, please refer to Document 400C Rev 1.3. Agents operating in the continental United States are to report any statistically significant drop in daycare, preschool, and primary school enrollment in their assigned region. Elements of MTF Beta 7, Maz Hatters, are to remain on call for identification, research, and termination of active SCP-400 infestations. 
Locations found to be infested are to be quarantined using cover story 139B, Bubonic Plague. Media inquiries are to be categorically denied, and all agents of the press demonstrating interest in the quarantine are to be detained and administered a Class B amnestic prior to release. Foundation personnel affected by SCP-400 are subject to quarantine of up to three weeks. If by this time anomalous effects have subsided, personnel are subject to psychological evaluation prior to return to duty. If anomalous effects are still present after the administration of a Class A amnestic, remaining personnel may be reassigned to non-anomalous research, administrative, and medical positions. Civilians exposed are to be administered a Class A amnestic prior to release. Please refer to Document 401-R for reintegration instructions by geographic region. Damage control for infestations affecting population centers of 500 persons or more may employ amnestic agent NUE-2 locally, if necessary. At least one active SCP-400 colony must be collected from all subsequent infestations and remanded to genetic research personnel with level 3-400 clearance. Description SCP-400 is the collective designation for an anomalous species of arthropod, similar to Armadillidium vulgare, or the common pill bug. SCP-400 individuals are morphologically similar to A. vulgare in appearance, but can be distinguished visually by bright red striping patterns on their dorsal carapace. Visual identification is only possible by individuals not under the influence of SCP-400's anomalous effects. SCP-400 is a parasitic organism, which feeds on human mammary secretions. Access to this food source is gained by habitation and manipulation of deceased human infants. Affected persons are subject to a Type 3 cognitohazard via a pheromone vector, which repurposes the natural child-rearing instincts present in all humans for its own feeding and protection. Those subject to this effect are unable to perceive SCP-400 or the damage it causes to infants. Exposure to D-Class assets has determined that the effect does not apply to video or audio surveillance, and that level 4 biohazard precautions are sufficient in preventing the effect's onset. Personnel briefed on SCP-400's effects show no special immunity to the false perceptions created by the anomaly. As of 1407-2005, the Ethics Committee has determined that future human experimentation with SCP-400 will only be allowed in unique and dire circumstances. As such, all information regarding SCP-400's relationship with humans and life cycle have been compiled from extensive surveillance and interviews conducted in the site of SCP-400's discovery. Conclusions are based on an observational period from August 2003 through July 2005. Infestation begins when 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 select an infant and access its crib. Precise criteria for this selection is unknown. In the seven colonies observed from inception, infant targets were between three weeks and two months of age. Upper and lower age bounds for infestation have not been established. Observation has failed to detect any instance of SCP-400 prior to appearance within the target crib. Parents and D-Class personnel present will be unable to perceive SCP-400. If any person passes within 0.5 meters of the infant, SCP-400 instances will collectively release a fine spray, which causes immediate disorientation and rapid loss of consciousness. SCP-400 will then begin to burrow into the flesh of the sleeping infant. Favored points of entry include the mouth, eyes, anus, navel, and armpits. The infant will not react to the presence of SCP-400 in any fashion, suggesting the use of local anesthetics. Cardiopulmonary activity in the infant will cease within the first 40 minutes of this procedure, and within three to five hours, movement will resume, followed by strained vocalizations. At this point, the infant is considered an active colony of SCP-400. Incapacitated subjects will awaken soon after the first vocalization and investigate. Parents or other adults present with an earshot will also show interest as per normal for distressed infant vocalization. If the original mother of the colony is present at this time, she will immediately begin breastfeeding, regardless of previous feeding schedule or practices. 
Over roughly the next 10 weeks, parents and other adults begin to show increased affection and protectiveness toward the colony. During this stage, direct observation by present adults and children will be unable to detect any abnormalities in the colony's physiology, despite numerous dermal perforations and jerky, unnatural movement. The colony is capable of basic vocalization and is able to emulate feeding, defecation, and play behaviors of normal infants with increasing proficiency. Decomposition is still visible via surveillance during this time, culminating in desiccation of the colony's remaining soft tissues. It is presumed that the final desiccation is an adaptation of SCP-400, developed to ensure the colony's continued structural integrity. By the end of the twelfth week, all observed colonies exhibited increased size, such that individual instances of SCP-400 are visible moving under the skin. Such colonies are considered mature, and individual instances will begin reproductive behavior during this period. During feeding, 7 to 12 SCP-400 individuals will exit the colony through one of its dermal perforations and take hold of any exposed portion of the host mother's skin for approximately 10 minutes before returning. Host mothers studied during this time begin to show increased progesterone production, as well as heightened levels of human chorionic gonadotropin, indicating an induced pregnancy. After an incubation period of two to three days, host mothers will birth 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 during her next sleep. Instances of SCP-400 have not been successfully tracked after birth. Maximum interval of dormancy before SCP-400 must initiate another infestation is unknown. After breeding behavior begins, the cycle will repeat once weekly for the duration of the infestation. No natural limit to SCP-400 infestation timeline has been observed. Of recorded infestations to date, all have occurred in the southeastern United States, in rural or mountainous areas, and in some cases, have gone unnoticed for as long as nine months. Improved detection and extermination of SCP-400 instances is considered a high research priority. Addendum 401 Interview 425 Forward 25th in a series of interviews conducted during the infestation of 2003. Mrs. B, interviewed by Dr. Marshall Grant, Agent Fabian Pertucci observing. Mrs. B has served as host mother to SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B simultaneously. The advanced state of decomposition suggests the colonies have been active for over two years. She and her deceased twins are considered strong candidates for patient SCP-400-0. At the time of interview, Mrs. B was isolated from SCP-400 for 15 days. Interview conducted on 10-7-2005. Dr. Grant. Good afternoon. How are we feeling today? Mrs. B. Where are my babies? What have you done with my babies? Dr. Grant. Your children are being treated for possible bubonic plague exposure, ma'am. They will be returned to you as soon as possible. Mrs. B. Subject strikes table. Oh, that's bullsh**. You can't keep them from me. You have no right to keep a mother from her children. Tell me where they are or so help me when my husband's lawyers hear of this. Dr. Grant. Mrs. B. We're on your side here. We want to help. If you'll just answer a few questions for me, we'll do everything we can to let you see them this afternoon. Mrs. B. I've already told you on the form. They're three months old. Male. Names expunged. Identical twins. Weigh about 10 pounds. They don't have any allergies. What more do you want from me? Dr. Grant. You said three months old? When were they born? Mrs. B. February 5th, 2003. Now will you- I'm sorry. I'm just- I love them so much. Never thought I would be much of a mother, but they have been such a joy. After my husband died, subject is silent for 15 seconds. They mean the world to me. I don't know what I would do without them. Not a day goes by, I don't feel blessed. Dr. Grant, 
I imagine you must. For the record, you're aware of today's date. Mrs. B. It's July the 10th, 2000 fu- Huh. Well, that's funny. I could have sworn they were only three months. My, time does fly. I must have a picture of them here somewhere. Subject accesses personal effects and produces a portrait of SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B prior to infestation. Here it is. Aren't they just so beautiful? Dr. Grant. Yes, ma'am. Now, has there been anything peculiar about your boys? Mrs. B. Well, there was that time in May when that doctor... No, nothing at all. If anything, they're doing too well. So healthy and full of life. I swear, little... Said Mama just yesterday. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry. What was that about a doctor? Mrs. B. Yes, he came to the house after they... Three second pause. Subject visibly confused. I didn't say anything about a doctor. Let me see my children, please. They're probably starving by now. They need to be fed. Agent Pertucci. Inaudible to Mrs. B. We're losing her. Come back to it. Dr. Grant. I assure you, ma'am. We're giving them the best care possible. Mrs. B. With that awful formula, I'll bet. Threw up the last time I tried that. Neither of them has touched it since. No. It's natural breast milk for them, 100%. My obstetrician said that they'll need it for at least another three months, and I'm not about to take any risks. Dr. Grant, isn't two and a half years a little long to be breastfeeding? Mrs. B, they're, they're only three months old. Dr. Grant, but just now, you had said... Mrs. B, I know what I said. It's your fault. Got my head all turned around. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry if I've confused you, ma'am. It's just... Mrs. B. Who the hell are you people anyway? Let me see my babies. At this point in the interview, Mrs. B refused to answer any further questions and exhibited increased emotional distress and separation anxiety. Post-interview medical examination revealed extensive ovarian and uterine trauma in excess of all other host mothers examined. Mrs. B was administered a Class A amnestic when observations were concluded and is currently under Foundation surveillance as a person of interest. Addendum 402 As of 14-7-2010, SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B have been active in Foundation custody for five years indicating that colonies may be able to survive indefinitely if continually provided with food. Level 4 biohazard precautions have successfully prevented not only reproduction of SCP-400, but also the spread of all cognitohazardous effects within Site-77. Limited access for experimentation may be granted with approval from the Ethics Committee and SCP-400's HMCL supervisor, currently Dr. Grant. Please allow up to 30 days for review prior to beginning any new line of experimentation. Addendum 403 On 5-10-2010, SCP-400-A ceased activity while in containment after ingesting an experimental nutritional supplement, allowing medical examiners to dissect the colony. Despite desiccation and decomposition, muscle tissues remain responsive to electric stimuli. Highest concentrations of SCP-400 can be found in the stomach, mouth, brain case, and spinal column. Of particular note is the presence of individual specimens periodically along major motor nerves in the extremities, indicating an unprecedented level of communal intellect, utilizing the infant's extant neural architecture. Examination of the pheromones produced by individual SCP-400 instances has revealed several hallucinogenic, amnestic, and soporific compounds, which are capable of reproducing SCP-400's cognitohazardous effects. Analysis of several compounds has revealed similarities to Class B and C amnestics currently in use by the Foundation, indicating a possible security breach, minimal risk. Aerosol concentrations of the mixture as low as 50 ppm have proven effective in initiating the effect. Further research into the genetic sequencing of SCP-400 is recommended. Item Number 
SCP-382 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-3821 is to be stored in a standard site containment room inside a 1.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 meter plexiglass box of 5 centimeter thickness at minimum. A video camera is to be kept trained on it at all times, though this is merely for observational purposes. Due to the area of influence and deleterious nature of SCP-382's effect, it should only be removed from its enclosure for testing purposes, with staff observing from a remote location. No personnel, Class D or otherwise, should interact with SCP-3821 for more than two hours, unless accompanied by at least one armed agent. Description In its inactive state, SCP-3821 is a large baby carriage, manufactured in 19 by in England. Its age shows. Metal components are heavily rusted, the rubber of the tires is brittle, and the cushion is missing. SCP-3822 appears to be an infant, months old, extremely emaciated, with several injuries that seem to vary with each manifestation. On different occasions, SCP-3822 has shown heavy bruising, broken bones, and sometimes data expunged, despite which 3822 could still make vocalizations, although it is unknown how this was possible. When SCP-3821 is not being interacted with, SCP-3822 manifests every to minutes, staying between and minutes. However, when a person places their hands on the handlebars of the carriage, 3822 will instantly manifest, and the period of time of both disappearance and reappearance will decrease to approximately one second. Any person who makes visual contact with SCP-3821 from now on referred to as the subject, is compelled to approach it and place their hands on its handlebar. While manifesting only intermittently, SCP-3822 appears to compound the effect when the subject sees it. This effect does not transmit through video feeds, transparent objects, or anything else that would separate SCP-3821 and its victim. And once the subject is in contact with SCP-3821, no one else will be influenced until the subject has died and SCP-382 has reset. As soon as the subject comes into physical contact with SCP-3821 and SCP-3822 has manifested, they appear to enter a trance, in which they will propel SCP-3821 in a small circle and make noises directed at SCP-3822, apparently intended to be soothing. As time passes, the subject will begin to weaken, and their body will begin to degrade, while SCP-3821 slowly begins to take on a new, shinier appearance. Rust will begin to flake off, revealing shiny metal underneath. The rubber wheels will become more supple, and a velvet cushion will appear inside. At the same time, each successive manifestation of SCP-3822 will appear with fewer and fewer injuries, while looking less and less emaciated. The subject will continue to interact with SCP-382 up until just under two hours, at which point they will perish due to massive widespread organ failure. Once the subject has perished, SCP-3822 will disappear, and SCP-3821 will return to its former, derelict appearance within 30 minutes. Addendum 382A On Date Expunged my research team and I began testing to determine whether a person of sufficient youth and physical fitness could sustain interaction with SCP-382 past the two-hour mark. D-382-GTF-87I was chosen for his age, and because he had been a physical trainer prior to data expunged, and kept in shape throughout his incarceration at his exposure to SCP-382 proceeded as normal, though the physical degradation appeared to progress at a slower rate than previous test subjects. After the two-hour mark, with D-382-GTF-87I still living, though in extremely poor condition, SCP-3822 manifested as usual, but did not disappear one second later. SCP-3822 then data expunged, consuming the then mummified corpse of D-382-GTF-87I, and proceeded to data expunged. 
Fortunately, only one other Class D was killed before SCP-3822 was terminated by Agent But the event has necessitated the amending of the SCP-3822 Special Containment Procedure somewhat. I don't feel that this warrants a change in classification level. Doctor Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.